Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Mind Clash Podcast, episode 70. Jesus, 70. What is that in dog years? At least 2 million, I think. What is that in bee years? All billions. I don't, I don't know what bee years are, but this week we are talking about beekeeping. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the endeavors of uh, some noble people to cleanse the south of all those pesky excavators and whoever else they can find uh, while they're out mining. But first, we should introduce who we all are. Uh, Kale, how, how, how was your week? You good? Man, okay. Uh, today was day one being back. Uh, at work from my 30 days of convalescent leave taking care of the old wifey uh holy crap i'm glad to be away from these raving lunatic children oh raving lunatic children god it was driving me nuts so back at work child free during the day at least and uh yeah i mean uh i had a pretty crazy week um this week, I started telling everyone I know, including my friends and you here right now, that uh, my family is expecting our first child. Oh, oh congrats. Nice. Nice. congratulations. Yay. Yeah, so rip my Eve career. Nah, it's even better. Wow. You, gotta, you gotta hold the little baby, and as long as you got one arm free for the mouse, and you can just... You haven't, you haven't lived until you've had a seed with a crying child on your lap. You can train him to be minors. I'll, I'll get their account started now. Look, if you can take a poop with a child on your lap, you can play E with a child on your lap. All right. Fact of the day. I'm sold. I'm sold. All right. Ro- oh, Ro- Roku. Uh, someone, someone wants to, yeah. Yeah, he wants to know what we're all drinking. And I, I, I have to lie. I'm getting a little bit of a cold here. I'm not drinking anything today. What a baby. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I've got two glasses here. I actually have uh, one is a commercial bottle of uh, Lagunitas Aunt Sally. And I put it as a side by side up to my uh, recent set. It's like a sour pale ale, kind of made in a uh, Berliner Weiss style. So it's very, it's it's very tangy. It's got a, like a lemonade, a lemonadey uh, flavor to it. So I, I actually like mine better. But I mean, it's kind of biased, right? I'm having a uh, Diesel Punk Stout. It's pretty good. Cycle, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good, man. Trying to get into some more PvP and Eve. Fight the burn, you know? You were shooting us this week. Yeah, that was uh, entertaining. We were feeding hard. Uh, You weren't the only ones. Good times. Uh, Orion, how's your week going? Uh, It goes. Doing some VA stuff and then uh, prepping for the the massive DRF uh, blob that is coming against us. Excellent, dangerous, and uh, exciting in the south. Southeast. Southeast. Uh, right, Rick, introduce yourself. I'm Right Rick. I'm the leader for Slice Alliance. We live in Declan. Good old Declan. Uh, Vic. Hi, I'm Vic. Uh, I lead an NPSI blobs group called Castle Poitot, part of PL. Oh, hell, Poitot. Praise Poitot. <laughs> Praise be. Did you know Poitot's the only name system in Syndicate? The I did. One. Will you fly the mini blue colors? All of them. My CEO's uh, true home system. You know, I would re-roll a character if you could choose to start in Poitot as your starter system. Hmm. That's a good suggestion. Ridiculous, but... A little good bit ser- rough out there, right? Eh? <laughs> It'd be a good Serpentis starting home system. Or, yeah. Fuck Serpentis Prime. Anyways, we got a bit of a crazy week. Uh, last week was the uh, CSM Summit in Iceland, obviously. Uh, all of the CSM were getting their words in with the dev teams. Uh, there's a whole lot of come out of that. Uh, before we jump into that, uh, too deep here, uh, this is a reminder, quick reminder. Uh, remember that Rogue Drone Accelerator event, the ULI Festival? Uh, this, is the last, gone. this is the last week you can inject those boosters. There's still about 20 mil in JITA. You, they last two days. You can still jam oh, them into your head. But they'll be, they'll be selling a JITA for a couple weeks after that. That's for sure. 
uh, yeah, they won't turn to expired, but they're good till the 31st. And then there is the Uli Festival booster. Will last you three days. It's only plus 10, but you can inject it on the last day and it'll last through, uh, you know, Thursday. Because Tuesday will be patch day. Happy Uli Day. Good reminder. Yes. But, I mean, uh, the thing that's distracted us all week, uh, well, besides these big fights, which we'll get into in a little bit later, uh, was the Upwell 2.0 Structure Changes blog, which was uh, dropped with the headline, Coming February 13th, Prepare Uranus. Did you say that? I added <laughs> no, the last part. Uh, <laughs> like, that's implied, right? Yeah. It's definitely implied. So this is a follow-up on uh, what uh, CCB was talking about at Vegas, which is the Upwell 2.0 design, uh, which they're basing around four major pillars, which we'll try to uh, cover in some form of compact, but we'll get lost. So the first is a full and a low power mode for structures. So this is uh, an ask from the community to make it easier to kill structures that nobody is using, similar to the way well, bosses... People don't leave them out there and just do they? Is that oh, a yeah. thing? People just yeah. Leave them? Those all out about out and about, huh? Same thing with posses though. Flow People just leave them there. Something? Yeah. I mean, posses become easy to kill when they run out of fuel, though, right? No yeah, shield I, timer. I think that's one of the good things out of the patches. That particular feature. So this will be a clearly identifiable signal on the structure where you'll see clearly, you don't have to scan it, you don't have to look at it, you don't have to open up the show info, it'll just say low power. So it'll easily be able to tell if you can shoot that structure, it will have significantly reduced shield and armor resistances, and then it'll fall immediately to the hull reinforce. Which I think everyone's goody, goody. pretty happy about. Goody, goody. I haven't heard any complaints about this feature. Down with the citadels, man. I'm sure we'll find a complaint in six months, but... Yeah, it'll be abused in some form or other, and there will be mass cries of panic in the streets. Mm -hmm. Probably from Highsec. I feel like Highsec. Well, I mean, you could troll Sov right now and just anchor several citadels, and people have to go th do three timers and waste Wait. time. I mean, you... Go through Delve. I mean, I know Vic can attest to that, that the structures are everywhere. It's just crazy. Yeah. If you're an enemy, I mean, you could anchor it, and then uh, if it, it successfully anchors, the defenders have three different timers to go through. Just horrible. It's going to be interesting when spies pull fuel out of structures, and then they drop to inactive, and then they can easily ref them. Yeah, but that's not really a thing with anything that's properly managed, because all the real alliances are going to have... <clears throat> Such good infrastructure that those people are not going to last long. Well, something yeah. I thought about was you need to tie tethering to fuel. No fuel, no tether. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's simple. It's something you could. Do. Well, I say it's simple. I'll back off that. Uh, it's, it would seem like it's something simply that you could tie to it. Every ice miner in Eve will love you, Orion. Well, Ryan, Ryan for CSM. There you go. There we go. No, no. Vic, Vic Jefferson is my champion at this moment. So don't be bad. <laughs> well, that 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 would be parody with stru with POS structures, right? Uh, when POSs were offline or not fueled, you couldn't they didn't have a shield. hide and be safe. You know, that, that was my whole thinking behind it. You know, it's just it just seems like you know if you're going to be able to tether, at least make them fuel the damn thing. Fair enough. Well, let's move into the second pillar, a new vulnerability and reinforcement system. It's probably simple. There's probably no complexity to it. Uh... Okay, brace yourselves. Do it. All right, first up, uh, the initial attack can be chosen by the attackers. So this is the system that Fozzie was implementing and saying that they'd implemented Vegas. Attackers, show up whenever you feel like it to shoot the structure. Great. Just like posses, right? You can start a timer on a pause anytime you feel like it. And, and Pocos. Pocos. Anything else? Yeah. So down with the old vulnerability system, choosing your, you know, four hours a week or ten hours a week that you're vulnerable. Enough of that. Second attack. 
So this is a uh, this is assuming that it's fueled and has all the structures online, so it's not going immediately into that low power reinforce. So second attack occurs in the time zone of the defenders on the day chosen by the attackers. So you're showing up on Thursday. You shoot the structure the first time. It comes out of reinforce on the Friday by in the time zone of the defenders. But the attackers get to choose that it comes out on Friday, similar to the way it's working now. Oh, but there's a slight change here. There will be a slight addition, and you won't know exactly when that timer is, but the only way to find out is to take a hacking module, so a relic or data and analyzer, and go actually hack a structure. So, you know, scout it, show up, hope no one's around, no one turns on the PDS, go in there, hack, find out the reinforcement, and then take that information back to your uh, FCs and plan out your next attack. Thoughts on I thought that, that was a really, I thought that was a really interesting thing to actually bring in there. Bring in like a really hardcore staple of PVE. Be like, this is a uh, now a staple of attacking structures, right? We're gonna have a lot more PVPers trying to learn the rule of six from Eve Scout, right? <laughs> rule of six. Go on. It's a nice gimmick. I didn't say I knew the rule of six. It's going to be... Well, I, don't it, but I've never done it. I don't crab. I, but it's, it's a gimmick. I mean, it's yeah, cool. It's yeah. cool. I just keep clicking until I win. That's the strategy, right? So, uh, oh. that's the second attack timer. And you've chosen your fight. You started on Thursday. Second fight timer on Friday. Probably the defenders are going to show up to that fight because they know when you're going to defend. But say you successfully defeat the defenders and you move on to that final hull timer. So this final hull timer is going to be in a on a day that the defenders choose in the time zone of their choice. So if you know that your opponent's timer is going to come out through your hacking and reconnaissance, that it's their prime time is US time zone, and their reinforcement come out day is Sundays then you can choose to have your fight in the best way possible to make that shortest timer uh, so that you know you're going to have to fight on Sunday and you know you're going to have to fight in U.S. time zone. So that varies slightly depending on the sec of space you're in. So this is a random X value that they add to the timers. So it's really short in wormholes. It's only half a day that you minimum have between your second and third timer. Uh, 2.5 days for low sec and null sec, and 5.5 days for high sec. So you attack it on Thursday, you find out that you, you have the second fight on Friday, and then you're in wormhole space, so you have to may, wait a minimum of half a day, and then it would come out Sunday afternoon. But if you're in high sec, you attacked it on Thursday, you, you fought the second time around Friday, you have to wait a minimum of five and a half days, and then you'd have to wait for the... And then you'd have to wait for the next prime time that's available. So it would be five and a half plus the rest of the days to Sunday. Math is hard. That's pretty, it's pretty rough for high sec, especially considering, I mean, like Delve, don't get me wrong, has a lot of citadels. But if you've flown through high sec, all of the structures there are just ridiculous right now. So many safe Fortizars, Astrohooses. I feel like that should be shorter. But a lot of them also aren't field, right? So you skip the armor time anyway. Mm -hmm. That is true. Yeah, it's it's going to be weird the way it works around high sec warm deck mechanics, considering it'd be really tough to get it to fit within the seven day. I guess Just, it, it never will. Yeah. You you'd have to do a two or three week war and just pay each time, pay each week to rip the war. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, so. I guess. Sorry, go ahead, Rowan. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's it's still a little funky with all that. I think the next thing, whenever they get a chance to, is look at this this war decking thing, so it could be a little hashed out a little bit better for that. But the seven days still seems like it's, or the high sec time still seems like it's a long, almost too much time. I love your little wind chime in the background. So if you're really bad at Eve, or you're really unlucky. The most amount of time that it would take for you to take down a high sec structure would be 14. In low and null sec, it would be 11. 
and in wormhole space it would be nine days. So this is unscouted, unprepared, you don't know what you're doing, you just attacked it for funds. Well, in high sec, it'll probably be on a contract, right? Uh, maybe. Aside from wormhole space, I don't know many people who just attack citadels for fun. I mean, in iron, that's uh, one of our main propagators of content. We'll just go into an area that we want to start a fight in. We'll attack a couple structures, and then if they don't undock for the first timers, they'll definitely be there for the second. And if they're really stupid and they let it all go to thirds, well, we get some free kills. I mean, isn't there an entire uh, corporation that, that just does that, where they go out and kill citadels? Yeah, I mean, they do it with Rec one ship, machine. like one Vindicator or whatnot. Yeah, it's the Wrecking Machine, right? That's a corp, or... Yeah, it's a high-sec group, yeah. I don't know the name. So what do you guys think about this uh, new structure timers? Do you think this is... It's a good step. Good step in the right direction. Yeah, I have to see, but so far, I mean, I don't really see major concern. Yeah, I digs. God, we're in agreement. Okay, let's find something to disagree about. Right? Let's, uh, let's argue about stuff. Uh. Okay, major structure combat overhaul. This is the next third pillar of the uh, new Upwell Structures 2.0 stress system. So there's lots of little pieces in this. There is. So the first one is that they want to move away from the way that webs and scrams work on citadels currently, as well as the void bombs. So in addition, in a, in, a, in a way to fix this, they're going with the structure having the super carrier projected weapon fields. So these are the AOE target painter, the weapon disruptor, the energy neutralizer, which replaces the void bomb, uh, ECM jammer, sensor dampening, stasis webifying, and warp disruption effects. So these are all available on super carriers. This will obviously be a little bit more powerful on cheaper structures like an Asbel, which is only four billion, but will require more skill and finesse to effectively use against a uh, attack. This is a this is a, a fairly big buff, I believe, to Citadels, and I'm not sure if Citadels really need a buff at this point. But this is a, a big buff, especially the warp disruption bubbles. You can just yeah. see. In just different things on here. The good thing is the void bombs going away. I think that limits the doctrines that you can put on the field against citadels. And if you l remove that, I think you open up a little bit of what doctrines you can use. But then you buff up different things inside the citadel, like warp disruption bolts. So kind of interesting choice here for the CCP. Yeah, I enjoy it. I think this is a good. This is a good change. Uh, no void bombs means, you know, like you were saying, the, the doctrines just open up a lot further for you. Shield doctrines can actually be a thing that you can use to an extent again. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's definitely limiting in the meta where you have to rely on one or two capless, capless guns, capless tank in order to be effective on the field. Like it, it really limits the meta. But if you've ever fought some super carriers, you in tie dye, especially in a big fight, you know that they also have the GTFO, the uh, module which scoops up a piece of your fleet and throws it across the system and then scrambles it in place. It's a, uh, it's a big boosher. Yeah, it's for the Titans, but um, yeah, there's a lot of drama around that at the moment. So, yeah, the current proposition is adding that as well to structures. Which, uh, I mean, if you're in a tie-dye fight, like the 9-Tech-4 fight that we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, that could be a long amount of time that you're spent warping yeah. back and forth to the station. And so, was, what, uh, I don't think you put it in the notes, but I'm fairly certain I read it where uh, they're planning on having that as a 90-second cooldown timer. Yeah. Um, timer, so pretty much every minute and a half, you can boosh, boosh, boosh. Well, and also... Uh, since it's like a citadel weapon, right? It doesn't follow the broken uh, mm -hmm. citadel timer kind of thing, or you know what I'm talking about the mm -hmm. uh, the broken repair timer thing. So basically, the 90 seconds comes out to I think uh, the 15 minute repair timer in 10% uh, tie dye, right, or something like that. So effectively, you boost them off, 
Um, and then as soon as like that 15 minutes in Thailand have passed, you can boosh again, right? So it's five minutes on Titans, right? Yes, that's correct. You are indeed correct. So it's a, that's pretty OP. Every 90 seconds compared to five minutes in a Titan. Yeah, but so, does a Titan get an aggression timer when that happens? I mean, that's the question. And is a Titan at risk when it does that, as opposed to, I think players are absolutely fed up with structures doing most of the fighting and most of the protecting of things, and they want to see player versus player, and they're just tired of seeing player versus structure. And structures were bad enough, but now they're they're more effective than spaceships, and the game about yeah. fighting spaceships. So that's just what I just don't understand. It's like, if you're scramming, if you're doing any kind of any aggressive action with a ship, or with anything in the game, you should stand to lose it when you do that. And I think that's a huge frustration with, the, with all the Citadels, is they risk nothing, and they can have a huge impact on the fight, and players don't like that. Yeah, I mean, right right before this, uh, before we started recording, I was actually in a fleet so we can kill a freaking Keepstar. And it seems like that's all we're doing, like, every day. It's like, oh, we got to go kill this Keepstar. Oh, we got to go kill this Astro House or uh, uh, Athenor. Yeah, some uh, somebody's linking in chat. Three days ago, um, Fozzie said that because of the feedback from the community, they will be potentially removing that module from the plan. And limiting or limiting it to high sec only, uh, because it's really uh, at least in high sec it'll be smaller fl- uh, smaller fights. So that particular module I think will be uh, removed altogether in the upcoming patch. Now my yeah, personal right? my personal opinion on on that module I think it would cause a lot of chaos and a lot of problems for FCs, especially the ones attacking, uh, even those that's aggress and are supposed to be defending. So I, I wanted to see it at least for a month and cause some chaos out there, but looks like CCP is going to pull back from this. Yeah, it's too broken. Uh, after the Keepstar fights, I've been involved with the CO2 one, and then just recently our Keepstar fight here. Um, it, it would have to be really boiled down to like a small circle. Like it can't using it to pull a whole DPS fleet away for any amount of time in tie dye itself will. You, you basically you can basically win the fight easily like that, or say if you manage to catch a bunch of fighters and pull enough fighters off to stop the them from doing enough DPS. I mean, uh, it it could be potentially game breaking. Yeah, I think I think the entirety of Eve agrees that keep attacking keep stars are like the most painful things in the world, or defending it for that matter, especially if you've been with the CO two attack back in MTACO. Um, but more than anything, it's it's not necessarily because of the functions of the Citadel and the DPS mechanics. It's also, the, the biggest part of it is the tie-dye. If you don't have lag, it would be a much more enjoyable battle. So tomorrow, when we have this Keepstar fight, it's going to be really, really painful if both sides commit. Not because of anything else, but tie-dye. Yep, as soon as the fighters get launched, you can... Uh... You can see it uh, max out on yourselves, like we saw today uh, during ours. As soon as the fighters were dropped in and started moving around, it really just put the crunch on the uh, on the servers. I mean, even on a GTFO uh, Citadel, that's the only super weapon they can use. You only have one slot for a super weapon. You could just use capitals, and you can't GTFO them. Yeah, I, w- I wonder if it impacts the fighters, though. The fighters would just warp back because they would be on a separate grid. Also, with the current GTFO, doesn't it fire kind of like a lance? Because if you're if you have fighters or fighter bombers and you're attacking a structure, then they tend to orbit that structure, right? So the uh, GTFO module wouldn't get many off at a time. Well, like in our instance, when the fighters were coming from the the X Death Fortizar, what we I mean, what you could ideally have done, depending on the range of that thing, is just as they're burning in, once they get within, start getting ready to orbit, you just do it at that point, and then you can just boost the whole line of them out. Well, I might be callous, but I, I don't think relying on single point FCs and relying on single point attack engagement points is is necessarily the way we have to hold out Eve. Even though we'll, even though the meta has evolved that way, that we have anchored up fleets that follow around and follow one doctrine. 
I don't think Eve has to play out that way. And personally, I think moving towards smaller, more mixed fleet doctrines makes a more exciting fight because there's more than just, are you in a Ferox? Are you in a Lodgy? Are you the FC? Well, I think you're seeing that now. I'm sure Ryan and Vic and Silo can even say about this. Like the fight with us today, there was Vexers, there was a T3D fleets, there was two T3D fleets. I think at one point Scepter's uh, Scepter fleet out there. We had guys in small gang ships peeling off Vexers that were spread around the Keepstar. I think we're actually starting to get away from that, but that's also due to the nature of these Keepstar fights, though, too, in that regard. Like to me, it actually does seem a little bit healthier than it has been in the past. I mean, there's definitely the MGD destroyers, bombers, and there's, there's always like extra pieces to a bigger fight, which is really healthy. I just kind of don't like the everything's focused around one large chunk of HP, which everyone's excited for because it's a big kill mail, but it's still kind of player versus structure, and I, I feel like the structure is having too much of an effect in the fight. Like it should the play it should be there as a spice, or as you know, as 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 a focal point of the fight. But it shouldn't be controlling the fight. And I think at lower at smaller scales, it definitely does, and that's oppressive. And once you get that many people on a grid, it doesn't matter what, what it is. It's it's only one small part of the puzzle. Yeah, going back to your original point about um, just having diversity, I think removing void bombs helps in that cause. Oh, for sure. Yeah. All right. So um, in addition to uh, these new defenses, uh, they are also proposing new fighters, which will be upgraded versions of the current fighters we now have. Uh, they will require more base materials. And they will yeah, be a link, link on those because uh, I don't see anything about what they're going to be called or anything. Is there any information on that or just a generalization right now? They'll be called the stand-up version of that fighter. Okay, okay. I just linked it in the uh, Twitch chat as well, what the oh, layout is of. The are most... we going to get stand-up shadows? We are. The thing is about nice. stand-up shadows is you'll have to buy a BPC from the Sasha's Nations, but it'll be an upgrade of the current shadow. So don't worry, low-sec incursion runners. Your shadow income will still be safe. You'll still need the original shadow, and then you'll upgrade it into a stand-up shadow. Nice. So they're hoping to encourage more uh, finesse and uh, player gameplay as the person controlling the structure, which apparently, not that I control structures very often, but apparently the controlling of structures isn't all that exciting as well. It can be very painful, especially in a keep star. It's, it's a lot better since the first one with CO2, but it, it can be... Uh pretty terrible if it starts bugging out on you and basically it can basically neuter the entire structure itself but usually you only see that at like the keep star level though kind of stuff uh next thing they're talking about is tech 2 versions of the stand-up modules so these will be uh higher fitting requirements with better optimal ranges better damage etc that's a good progression yeah makes sense Leaves it open for faction modules from the pirate factions. Or uh, or versions from the uh, MPC factions. Or Concord. I think it's obvious to have like refinery upgrades from the ore. Yeah, don't they have the Hyasoda one or whatever it is already as a faction kind of thing, right? Yeah, that was a parody with a POS module, right? And the Thunder yeah, Tribe one? Uh, in addition to changing the way webs and scrams work, uh, as far as the burst protectors, they're also going to change the way that people can currently now like choose the anchor and then permanently web and scram that target until the structure runs out of capacitor. Uh, there will now be a reactivation delay on the uh, scram effect, and you'll only be able to affect uh, put one scram on the structure, and that will be 30 seconds of effective scramming with a 90 second. Let me check my notes. One minute reactivation. So 30 seconds on, 60 seconds off. This is to balance out the fact that the structure is available to be attacked 
at all times of the day. I think that's a, it's kind of a nice buff, but a nice kick into the teeth for small gang roaming mm -hmm. at the same time. Because I can't tell you how many times we've landed on a structure that was in its vulnerability with someone in it. And there was someone aggressed on the outside that we were trying to kill. And it's like, okay, the structure is vulnerable. We got like three dudes. That structure is a scram. We can't really engage this. What's cool is that you can't permacycle that scram now. So potentially if your dude lo lives long enough uh, while being shot at by the structure, he can warp off. But on the downside, I believe that uh, you can always use those tackle modules even when invulnerable now, right? Which I think is... Just a really horrible idea. Well, they're, well, they're vulnerable throughout, right? For the shield timer. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. and yeah. They're, they're kind of going back a little bit towards the like the the whole pauses. You know, you warp to a pause and have those modules on there. It's going to nab you if you sit around there too long. But no, it's like a twenty four seven kind of thing, right? Yeah, and that's if someone's in it though as well. Yeah, they'd still have to be all it. sitting in the seat and then lock you and target you and throw the scram on you. It still doesn't. It still. I think it offends players, though, in terms of like to be able to scram or point or web or anything. You should be vulnerable when you're doing it, and it's just stupid to me that you know if a structure is scramming you, you had no chance of actually turning that structure into a lost mill when it was scramming you. If it's just normal roam, and you're out and about, and it scrams you and it kills you because of it. That player was at no risk to actually impose that risk upon you, and that to me seems like it doesn't belong in Eve at all. And I. Structures are just irritating as heck. I 100% agree. But isn't that parody with posses pre Citadels? You know, see that the beautiful thing about posses were that there were so many interesting mechanics of playing with them that a lot of people like figured out the nuances and how to you know be creative with the mechanics. Um, I, I mean, it's not perfect, but you could at least disable the scram and web batteries. You can't do that to a to a Citadel. Like, if, if you're not going to attack a posh willy-nilly, and, you know, if you do it right, it's not going to be able to fight back. Whereas, opposed to you, people just run to structures, and they become, it's like god mode, pretty much. <laughs> like, structures shouldn't be able to actually activate modules on anybody or anything like that, unless they've been brought down uh, by a small chunk of their HP. That way that you can't use them for, like, riskless PvP, right? Exactly. That's. I mean, we're from different parts of the game at this point, pretty much entirely, and we feel the exact same way. It's Eve's all about skin in the game. If you don't have that skin yes, in the game, absolutely. Where's the fun? I could tell you from a uh, miner's perspective, they will enjoy this. Well, that's another thing too, because a lot of what's been going on is people will time their uh, vulnerability timers for their uh, moon miner extractor things to the same times that they have. Um, like mining ops basically so they give a free hit on grid yep, that you can't yep. do anything about it. and that's fundamentally like the most irritating thing because the whole point of of the you know part of the moon mining changes to me are you know you have to be out in space and vulnerable and small gangs can come and harass you and you can form up and fight them and it's a good you know it's a good impetus for content it's a good um ratchet up for content but as soon as you have an invincible hector on grid that has like a 200 kilometer strand whatever it is it's dumb you it's it completely spoils the entire experience. Yeah, I think this buffs moon miners significantly. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying they're perfect, but at the moment, you know, in we talk about conflict drivers and we you know, getting back at people and stuff, and there's people don't seem like there's a lot of things to fight over, you know. Why don't you know it, it may hurt small gang or stuff like that, but why not go after those people? Why not hit that structure again for being, you know, that thorn in your side, you know? I know other bigger groups, this is a problem, whatnot, but, you know, it just seems like this would be, it's not perfect, but it's at least better. And I, think I, it, I, I understand where you're going with that entirely. I just feel that the bar for content shouldn't be just big ticket ops, which that basically segues into, in my opinion. And so, like, if the only way to get content is to bash a structure, that's not very healthy because to do that, you need certain tools and certain numbers and certain all this stuff. And there should be more to even just forming up for structures. And like, there should be roams. There should be this. There should be that. No one's realistically ever going to attack most of the uh, the Arthenors or whatever in, in Deep Gnome because just getting out there with something that can impose a real risk to it, it's not going to happen ever. I think, again, 
in a lot of regards to a lot of larger blocks. Like I'm, I'm not gonna be able to take a roam out and see a, a vulnerable Athenor from like what you know slice and be able to go smack that without getting you know just absolutely having the house dropped on me. But like in retrospect, we went through a system in the drone lands and we I saw two anchoring. We sent some guys out there. I think it was like 15 dudes and we killed two of the anchoring Athenors. Okay, I'm trying to drop the house on you. That's fine. That could be a segue to even more entertainment. But the fact that the Arthenor itself is scramming somebody and it doesn't have to have any skin in the game, as Cyclo would say, is dumb. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of you know what happened in Losac. I know um, Kale's Corp was mining and uh, they timed the scrams uh, to when they would actually be uh, pulling those asteroids and they were able to scram a uh, blob ship and kill it because of that scramming module. This is a big buff to moon miners and uh, they're going to be <clears throat> jumping up and down uh, thanking CCP when this patch comes in. What would you think? What would you think if they got rid of the scram function? Since most citadels can use fighters, let every citadel at least have one set of support fighters, like a set of sirens. Well, here's actually uh, something that I've been thinking about. What would be really cool is if they kind of got rid of the scram, but if they turned it into like a uh, infa hick point that doesn't scram, right? So you can use that to hold down your supers, your titans, and whatever. Uh, for like 60 second intervals. And then if you can't get like a Dictor or a Hector or something to go uh, pick up the scram, then uh, like it'll be let go. It gets rid of the scram issue and you get to, CCB gets to, instead of getting rid of a module, which I'm sure they would hate to do, they can uh, re-platform the module into a different role, right? Yeah, I mean, I get what they're doing, right? So you got your vulnerability 24-7, and therefore your ability to scram should be available 24-7. So it's it's a balance. I, I say just let it play out. Let's see what happens. And uh, if it's too op, then it's too op, and change it down the road in a month. But uh, a I month? see what they're That's very uh, optimistic. Yeah, <laughs> I always go with 30 days. I wanted to get the fuck out module for 30 days at least. That would have been so much fun just... Causing chaos. I was like, I'm calling it. It'll be in the game for a year if they put it in. I, was, I, th I think they're listening a bit more. I, I, maybe it's just me, but it seems like they're listening a lot more. Like the outrage for the GTF mo O module, and maybe it corresponded because the CSM was there as well, and they could kind of pound it in their ears as well. But it seems like they're listening a bit more when they release these things. So hopefully, you know, if these things do come out and they're just not right, hopefully we can get them fixed fair, quicker than we normally would. Yeah, I mean, Fosse's already responding to this, right, three days ago. So they're listening, yeah. at least for that particular module. He's got like 25 yeah. posts in that thread. Uh, the last combat upgrade that the uh, Citadels will be getting, uh, all structures will be getting in the... the Upwell 2.0 change will be a 400 kilometer locking range uh, with uh, existing targeting rigs and modules, allowing it to be expanded to 490 kilometers. Yeah, this is another big buff. Yeah, it's like every subcap, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why this was even suggested to be in here, but... Um... You know, you can you can still use carrier supers and whatnot at range uh, above the 490 kilometer range, but uh, we did at one point use Titans against um, goon citadels in, in uh, I think it was pure blind, and it was mainly because you could put the the Titans at the edge and then put the triage right behind them, and uh, citadels couldn't hit the triage, and this basically counters that. I think that's the only reason why this particular feature is here. Yeah, yeah, this is the same way Tri was doing with the Solar Keep Stars. What we did, the exact same thing. Yeah, maybe CCP think, didn't like that gameplay. I think it'll make super pilots feel a little less safe launching their fighters, fighter bombers on citadels, which is kind of a shame uh, because it'll be a lot harder to convince them to deploy fighter bombers to try and kill you when you're trying to. Drop some dreads on them. I mean, this is a narrative that I've read through a lot of the content uh, that has been posted this week around this 
all these combat changes is a feeling that an attacking force shouldn't lose much. More than ammo, more than just a couple tackle ships. I don't think most attacking FCs want to lose much of anything on an attack because they feel like they don't get any value out of the kill other than, you know, the four bill Asbel or the, you know, 1.5 bill Athenor. Well, I think more than that, FCs want content for their dudes that's entertaining and interesting, right? Yeah. Just that's kind of what you want to br- when you when you're bringing out a fleet that's kind of what you want to bring to the fleet you don't want to go okay guys let's go grind the structure for uh 30 minutes you want to go hey guys let's go fight yeah because all you gotta do is sit there press f1 walk outside have a cigarette come back oh i'm not done reloading yet all right wait a second reload all right go get a grab of coffee whatever yeah i'm sure a lot oh, of the man. viewers are very familiar with the phrase yeah guys we're gonna go on this roam real quick but just really quickly, we need to do this one thing, and it turns into a structure bash. Mm-hmm. I promise, guys, there's no solve wanting. Ten Load. minutes later. <laughs> Load non-faction ammo. Yeah, I mean, a defended Citadel is a great fight. I mean, we had one this week. Uh, it was a second timer, armor timer. We refed four structures. We came back for the second round of fights. And then we played the full escalation chain from subcap versus smaller subcap to uh, escalated caps to escalated caps on top of that and then caps on top of that. And then a full another fucking fleet came in, whelped our fucking initial subcap group. Then we reshipped and came back in another group and saved our tackled caps and then fucking got some of that shit out. It was amazing. Are, are you in a roundabout way saying it was caps on caps on caps? It was uh, subs on subs on caps on caps on caps on. Oh god, too many fucking wormhole subs on top of caps. Fucking intense. It was great. Never more than two hundred people in the system. No tie dye. Yeah, cool. unfortunately, we didn't have that option. <laughs> First time I thought I was gonna lose my nidhawker. Did not. Yeah, we had a lot of stuff going on in ours. It was uh, it was actually entertaining. I, I, it was probably the most fun I've had in a Keepstar fight. For ours, at least. And the test brought Max, so did it X-Death, along with their Blues. How long did it last? Oh, let me look. It was a good two hours, at least, I would think. That's not too bad. No, it wasn't too bad, but I, I we were chewing through Max midway through it, and then they started undocking T1 fit Vexers. And they were trying to spread them around the keep with wardens. And these are 100 MN, or dual prob, 100 MN, Mark or uh, A being Vexers with wardens, meant to hit out to like 75, 100, or whatever. And they were just trying to prop around the keep. So we were just free firing on them once the max got out of the way. And they just, it was a slaughter at that point. So I don't know what their theory crafting with that is. I imagine we'll probably see caps from test and or probably DRF again in full swing. DRF did use carriers and brought boated over a bunch of uh, SS fighters, but the, I don't know if Tide I had an issue with them or something. But we were chewing through Max still very very quickly, with even them shooting a bunch of our fighters. Did they reinforce it? No, no. Okay. I'll link a battle report here shortly. I just got pulled. We get a drag for Sven real quick. Hmm, yes. Oh. Oh, hey, Sven. Hello, Sven. Hey, what's up? No, he didn't say it with like an accent. Yeah, hello, I'm Sven. <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to disappoint. <laughs> you want to go for a jog, yeah. You can give us an introduction of who you are. Who do you fly with? Hey. Hey, so I'm uh, Sven Holstein. I fly with Ro Capel. Uh On paper, I am a... Uh, head diplomat, but realistically I'm just a guy who flies with them. Yo. It's awesome. Uh, just just had fun uh, shooting drones and and uh, test with Try, so that was good. Ah, so you were there. Okay, cool. <laughs> I think the greatest thing I've ever heard on comms was, alright guys, free fire on Vexers. 
<laughs> it was it was just hilarious. I soloed like seven vectors with my Tyrannus. Sounds like faction wars. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. Well, what's next there, Merdud? Uh, do you want to go into moon moon stuff or moon mining stuff in wormholes and high sex? Uh, didn't, didn't they already have a moon mining in them, or is it they're just at, ran, adding that now? In the past, they didn't have moon mining inside wormholes. Right. But I knew they were going to add it. I thought they already had added it. Is that not here yet? This is confirmation that they are going to add it. Okay, so that'll be the February 13th patch? Yes. So this will be uh, moon mining in 0.5 high sec systems and in wormhole space. Just uh, 0.5 or 0.5 and above? No, just 0.5. Okay. So heck, heck is in there. Um, well, obviously, there needs to be moons. I don't know. It, yeah, there has to be moons and heck. I'm sure there is. I don't know. Did they fiddle with it? Like, they fiddled with... I, I don't see how this is a bad thing. At least on no. the outset. I think it's... Uh, at least get some of the high sec folks kind of looking at this mechanic, you know? So, reading from the thread on this, from Fozzie's thread there, um, an interesting thing to keep in mind if you're hearing about this now and want to start up a moon mining operation in high sec there's no way to stop someone from mining in your moon belt without ganking them or war decking them you do not own those rocks you own the structure but the asteroids are just asteroids could draw some interesting you can't own the rocks yeah, yeah. Conflict. Yeah, get off my lawn kind of deal you know <laughs> You, you can't so, own the rocks, man. They're Bob's rocks. Let me get this straight. Um, moon mining in the high sec is going to be more of a content driver than moon mining in null sec or low sec. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. <laughs> more, more high sec content. There you go. Just don't, well, just don't. I mean, that's great, right? I mean, this, this will hopefully, you know, get people kind of digging into it, start PvPing more, maybe some of these groups who nor traditionally wouldn't. Uh, this is, I think this is all around good thing. Yeah, I don't know that I completely buy that. I'd love to see it happen, but with how um, you know, ravenous the big null blocks are about scooping up new players and sticking them in big alliances, I don't really see that much potential in high sec. And again, correct me where I'm wrong, but if you can you know, throw a new player and say you can be in Oracle in a couple months if you just grind up mining for a long time, they're going to be doing so much better out in null than they could possibly do in high. And of course, you're always going to have people that stay in high. Maybe it's a great segue to start learning other aspects of the game, but uh, I don't know. I'm skeptical. There are whole well, groups uh, in high sec that do want to be there and haven't been driven out of the game by uh, constant blanket decks. It'll, yeah, I mean, it'll probably be good content drivers for them. The, the, the bulk of Eve's players are in high sec, though. So at least there will be content there for them. Um, yeah, and hopefully the we can of, I mean, think of, that's another thing, too, is like Null is probably completely decimated the price of minerals. I mean, it depends what you're, what you're doing with them. But yeah, if you're importing them back to high sec, what does that do? It has to be valuable enough to fight over to make people fight. Yeah, I mean, I, can, I, I remember I my high sec days when, you know, I've. I, I've blowing up somebody's MTU and they start shooting shooting back at me. So there, There's ways to get content out of there. Uh, I can tell you as uh, someone who likes to build capitals but doesn't do much mining myself, the mineral prices will be pretty good for uh, people in high-sec high mining. Anytime, anytime goons slow down in their mining, the uh, market crashes and a lot of minerals aren't available anymore. Hmm. wonder why, Vic. <laughs> I did hear some speculation on talking on stations this week that uh, the amount of possible ore that could be coming out of wormhole space, especially low class wormholes, oh, will yeah. be a potential sink on prices. Yeah, I might be going into a wormhole and mining the shit out of some ore. So the other thing I the other thing I think is important about the uh, high sec mining is that um, this could be a segue to getting rid of static belts. Mm. Oh, I don't I don't know if you can really do that though with the indexes at least within null sec and whatnot. Because if you think CCP wants to anger the Matani, come on. Yeah, unless the, unless there's going to be like. 
and like unless you can keep one anomaly for mining there, if you like start removing asteroid belts, how are you gonna get the industry up to one, you know, in a system? Uh you mine the moons. I mean I, I I'm not saying that's exactly what they're gonna do, but I mean I would think that would be an interesting way to do it because that would help to create a scarcity of resources. But then maybe possibly if if they did and that fights. You need mines. war. <laughs> I would see an announcement around ice belts first. I don't know how they would incorporate that in, but that seems like a lack currently. Ice planets. Well, if it was like ice real planet. life, the 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 asteroid belts might be more randomized. Because you're actually like, oh, asteroid belt, we we're gonna suck it down and then wait a couple hours and suck it down again. I mean, I'm sure there's different ways that they can do ice. Either just seed ice on specific moons or like throw up a comet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's interesting, a lot of interesting there. A lot of uh, resources. Uh, last thing to note about these uh, moon mining structures in high sec and in wormholes is that they will be producing the higher 15% ores and R4s. There will be no high end moon minerals coming from those moons. Yep. Using R4s, that'll actually be pretty good for high sec miners because right now no one is mining R4s. That'll be a huge income for them if they really want to get into it. I'll do it. So it's probably not of note, but they have steadily been removing the uh, the normal belts in high sec via the uh, NPCs that mine, right? I mean, those have been chipping away oh at those. Goodness. Those things make me so mad. <laughs> They send in like fucking five, six retrievers, and the belt is gone within like an hour or two. Just shoot them, Kale. Come on. Well, no, I want, I want those. I want those asteroids. Just shoot, why shoot the miners? Because I'm doing some secret squirrel shit in high sec, man. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, I think that would be a perfectly valid reason to put moons in high sec. Is if they're making it so people have to actually do something other than just like I'm gonna undock with my skiff and mine in a belt and nothing's going to happen. Yeah, I think if you'd kept it to like point sevens and below, leave like point one point oh's and point nines, maybe point eights. I don't know. I don't know the granularity at that top end, but like leave it so that really, really new people can still just warp to an asteroid belt and find some asteroids. They don't have to worry about joining a group to find a moon mining op. I can see that. Add beacons as well uh, to warp to the moon mining belts, and then the new bros could like see the timers on it and go try and steal some, try and be uh, the villain. You could also have NPC moon mining operations in the really high, high sex stuff. Oh, that would make so many people mad. The yeah. Am the Amar Empire sanctioned Athenor that's mining in Jita, you know? Or Amar, sorry. And then that would be a beacon site that you could go to and mine at. That would be, let's be completely honest here, though. That would be mined out by uh, somebody multi boxing like 30 <laughs> skiffs. And that's the only person that would be mining that. Skiff a get in. No. But they could be like temporary sites. Somewhere. I mean, it happens with ice belts. Yeah. And those are temporary. All right, last couple of features here uh, in this long list of changes. Uh, there will be a five minute fitting invulnerable state that will be added to upwell structures during the deployment process that will fall after the 24 hour anchoring period but before the structure becomes vulnerable to attack. So people talk about like the strength of keep stars and everything like that. And really all the keep stars that have died, save for a couple, I think, I think most of the keep stars that have died have died in the anchoring process, right? Because that is the only time you can feasibly attack them without taking massive losses. And I think that this is just a horrible mistake because now you can completely fit your keep stars before they become actually uh, vulnerable, right? Yeah, once again, another buff to Citadels. Yeah, and, and for a platform that's way too strong for the cost at every size level, that's kind of ridiculous. I think 
<clears throat> I think they're overall Eve. Most Eve folks don't really like this, and I think Bozzy has mentioned something about that as well somewhere else. But at the moment, no one really likes this idea at the moment. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's one of those things that if you want to put down a structure, you should be able to hold the field or sneak it in. You shouldn't get the advantage of the uh, effectively invincible um, recon. Well said. Yeah, because especially if it's a large structure, you've you've got to you've got to commit quite a bit depending on what it is. You know, if you don't catch those forzars and anchoring at a certain time or say you're off busy doing something else and you hear a ping, you know, once that 15 minutes is up or whatever it is, or you miss that whole time or you're done. Now you give it five minutes to fully fit before you can do anything about it. It's, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. I actually don't like this idea at all. A way to make, uh, make it so there's more structures in space. Congrats, CCP. You did it. We didn't think you could do it, but you did it. <laughs> Uh, the next change will be to carriers, which uh, while you are tethered at a structure, if you launch your fighters, which is, you know, kind of an aggressive action. It's definitely aggressive. You will not be tethered. The way it should be. That's fair. fair enough. Yeah, we have, I, have, I don't think anyone has any issues with this. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. It's especially going to be fantastic for uh, hunting ratters. Because, like, what ratters pull their fighters before they leave the belt? So you're gonna have you're gonna have carriers warping back to station, and I don't know if you can abandon your fighters while they're in warp to you. So if someone lands ahead of you, they can still point you before your fi fighters land on grid, so you can abandon them. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, but you see, I mean, and again, this is coming from somebody who regularly kind of does that. There's a lot of dum dums and all already that will aggress you on Citadel thinking they're invincible or lock you or something, and you can usually just drop the house on them and smash them. But the opposite of that is, well, there's things like PDS and scrams and things like that, which basically mean you can't really fight on the Citadel, and you can't really even gank on the Citadel because of all those things. Well, for the rest of us who don't always roam Delve, most Citadels and ratting systems are usually unpiloted. It's true, and it's good that I'm, I'm happy that they do have the, the number in them listed. I think that's a good move, but I, I still think that, you know, those things are still a little bit strong. This is a good change, but I still don't think it helps that much, as much as you think, because the real low-hanging fruit that don't understand things are, still, are already getting decimated by Citadel mechanics. I think it's just a good little tweak. Probably silly that you can launch fighters, drive them across the grid, and still be invulnerable right up until you hit F1 and kill them with something in one shot. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that, this is a step in the right direction, at least. The worst of uses I've seen on this is they're on top of uh, a ping off a gate. They have the fighters down. Yeah, the, the gate camp. Yeah. If you're moving from Fountain to uh, Cloud Ring right now, that gate camp probably exists. All right, uh, next change, which is another part of the risk reward of being in uh, upwell structures, is there's been complaints about how asset safety is a little bit too safe and that the value uh, that you can protect within dropping another structure in the same system, you know, prevents, you know, any significant loss to the defender uh, when the aggressor is put all that effort in to kill the structure. So there'll now be a, a new checks on the asset safety mechanics. Uh, there will be a new calculation to make sure that items don't have a value of zero. So I'm guessing this counts towards blueprint copies, blueprint originals. Uh, there will be a minimum asset re safety recovery cost of half a percent of the item's value, regardless of whether or not you bring it back to the same structure. And uh, they are currently looking at adding the asset safety costs to the kill mills of structures for attackers to see how much damage they inflicted to the opponents. Which bigger kill mills I'm always down for. It's good intel. I mean, it's okay. 
Well, if you... I, I think this is basically putting a band-aid over a rather large wound. And I'm just saying, in terms of, like, like if you go into wormhole space, people really do fight tooth and nail and will call all their friends in for a Citadel fight. And the other side will also do the same. And it's produces some of the most amazing and actually, like, feels like Eve amazing kind of fights because there's actually something on the line. And people get all into it, and it brings up the best in the game. Even if there's loss, but it's still really... There's anti on the table, and both sides will have legitimate throw down the kinds that we that are hard to get other places because people just have to keep on docking and keep getting back there because everything's on the line ask to say if he just spoils the entire thing and the only thing you're really doing by making like the, the kill mail bigger is incentivizing all people who just want to tag the mail to get like the, the kb stats and that's just dumb they, like be there for the fight be there for the throwdown be there for the, the oh no the number is bigger on the mail that i wasn't really a part of The, the other perspective on this is you know, outside of just wormholes, I think um, what miners and uh, folks that uh, manufacture and null do, instead of transferring from refineries, uh, using freighters back and forth, they usually do asset safety and just wait for a few uh, few days. I think it takes a week and a half or so, and then it gets transferred to their manufacturing hub uh, without them having to use their freighters. But this kind of adds some pain for them. All right. Um, that is essentially some of most of the changes coming to structures on February 13th. Of course, if you have feedback on these structures, just don't go rage post on Reddit. Uh, make it or do. Well, what do you want? I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you what to do with your life. If you want to rage post on, on uh, Reddit, that's your, uh, that's your prerogative. Or go post in the forums, make a thoughtful thread, and CCB will listen. Or not. They will read it. Likely. If it's thoughtful. All right. Um, we're going to drop into some battle reports. Player news. Yeah, and these these battle reports are actually uh, fairly relevant to the to the indiv individuals we have here because it has to do with uh, whelping the uh, Keepstar at nine tac four RP two. Uh, that was on uh, last Monday. Yes. Oh, it hasn't been whelped yet. This okay, no, it was attacked on Monday, and now it's going into its timers. So yeah, there was the initial attack on Monday, which was a decent fight. And then Tuesday was a big showing on both sides from uh, the North, which is Guardians of the Galaxy, Panfam, Horde. It's a Horde Keepstar. Uh, and Darkness. Yep. Slice, I'm guessing you guys are there. Mm -hmm. And yep. from the South, it's Imperium and all of their allies, Initiative, uh, TNT, Bastion, Brothers in Arms. This fight's going down in Cloud Ring, 9 Tech 4. Uh, the Tuesday fight was quite exciting. I watched that at home from uh, the Averin stream, which is, uh, he's a Pandemic Horde guy. Super tie-dyed, maximum tie-dye. Both Super Cap fleets were very well staged. Uh, everybody had their dicks ready out to put on the table. Uh, goons had anchored structures, citadels, all around the grid of the Keepstar. They had uh, something like... 10 Astra Houses, uh, two Fortizars, and some Retarus. So these were all onlining at the same time that the Keepstar was coming out of Reinforce. So the goons brought in uh, their super and carrier fleets, which there were like 250 titans, uh, mixed armor and shield, and about 340 supers. I don't yep, think sounds the, accurate. I don't think the titans came in. I think the supers came in. But about 2,400 Imperium pilots total are recorded to be uh, involved from the uh, article brought to you by uh, Matterall. And uh, the Northern Forces uh, amalgamated 3,000 forces, uh, individual pilots, uh, with about 230 Titans and, 800 and or 280 Supers. 800 Supers, goddamn. That's a scary day I don't want to think about yet. The exciting, most exciting part of this fight was when uh, the North aggressively deployed three titans on top of the goon carrier blob two immediately bosun onto the carrier blob 
with a calculated amount of DPS that could have potentially wiped the whole carrier fleet. But That's a very bold move. Super bold. Suicide fucking titans. Well, they were shield titans, so all shield titans are suicide. <laughs> easy. Easy. <laughs> So three titans on zero on this carry blob. Bosons go off. Uh, the bosons didn't uh, catch all of their targets, not the way they expected them to, and only one or two carriers died, uh, resulting in two of the titans being immediately blapped by the supers and carriers and subcaps on the field. I still don't know how the levy got out. But the levy escaped. Just moonwalked over to the Keepstar. Is a spirit animal, spirit animal, Zoidberg. I guess uh, goons uh, scram the primary and the secondary. Don't need those tertiaries. <laughs> and when tie dye kicks in, things can get funky. Like you can see bubbles go up on things, and you can just watch people warp away because of the server ticks and stuff like that. Or they could just be bad. That that is another thing. But uh, yeah. I- Focused on the Titans, and the Keepstar was saved, and the Northern Blob uh, left and went home, and Goons went ahead and hit it again. Yeah, so they sent their fighters over from the Super Blob, reffed it, and uh, that is bringing us to tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Well, they hit it the day after as well, and then this is the final timer now. Yep, there'll be two Keepstars probably being hit yeah. around the same time. So everyone is hyping this fight. He's gonna be there. I am. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be there. It's it's gonna be a tie dye fest if both sides commit to this. And uh, yeah, so I'll probably. I mean, I, I'll be done with work in the U.S. time zone, and I'll still probably be able to make the fight. You'll just the way tie dye works. It's just horrific when it keeps our grid. Yeah, I think this one's going to be closer to what the CO2 keep was like tie-dye-wise, where it's a, it's an all-day event. Yeah, it was an all-day event. In fact, in the CO2 Keepstar fight, um, you know, I had a bomber fleet with me, and we went and signed out and started hunting in Losec and other parts of Null. And then finally, when it was on the last you know few percentage points, that's when we, was, <coughs> that's when we started whoring and jumped back in. Yeah, I'm actually going to take out my Thanatos for the very first time as a PvP uh, asset. Very nice. A bear tail. Yeah, I'm definitely going to stream that. So the hype is that potentially this could be a million dollar battle. One majillion dollars. Can you believe that? Is that Pro God's uh, post? Yeah. Yeah. You You guys think the North will commit to the fight? Well, the, the North has committed to the yeah. fight even on the armor timer. Um, yeah, but yeah. they didn't hit, and then we left, and that's when they hit it. So we're like, okay, we're going to leave you alone for the armor timer um, and then force you to do the hull. Yeah, there was talk of not wanting to CTA push people too hard for every timer. Yeah, because, I mean, you could troll the armor timer all day long, so might as well see what you're going to do for the hull timer. Well, as a commentator, I'm looking forward to that fight. I hope that there's a fucking big old kill mail and a lot of uh, great battle report. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that we actually do see uh, a decent battle. and It'll stretch over into the U.S. time zone, AU time zone. Get everybody in. Maybe yeah, the Australians will get some. The unfortunate side, I don't know, this has kind of been another piece of talk around this week, is that the structure repair timer isn't tied to tie-dye. So the structure will start repairing when its timer comes out, and regardless of the slow motion fight around it, it will still repair. I mean, judging from what the goons have um, in terms of, of carriers and supers, I'm sure they could put DPS on it. It's something as simple as telling them, hey, take one set of fighter bombers and keep it on the keep star. Like, that's that basically, that's what you do with these structures. If you're fighting on a grid like that, you, you'll have either a subcap cleaver, you'll set aside a, a certain carrier group, or just have everyone one set of fighters on the structure while you DPS other things. 
yeah, I, I can't speak uh, to the specifics, but I'm just going to say that it's going to be a lot of fun if both sides commit uh, and seeing kill mills back and forth. But it's going to be painful in terms of tie dye. Anybody who has been to a Keepstar fight before, this is going to go into the Australian time zone. I can bet on it. So buy some extra beer, call in sick, uh, lock up your wife, and uh, be there in your fleet. Or if you're just going to there to solo or a small gang and pick up some third-party fight shit, get your fleet staged now because uh, you don't want to be moving under heavy tie-dye tomorrow. Yeah, I, I'm sure that if anyone wants, like, doesn't want to actually get involved in the tie-dye, there's going to be plenty of people either reshipping or trying to go join. And so just roaming around the areas around 9-Tag-4 is going to be some good fights. Yeah, there's there's going to be two or three main pipes where ships are going to be coming through. So if you want to mess around and you don't belong to any particular political group, just go ahead and set up a bubble and have fun. I'd recommend the Horde pipe. Indeed. What did you say? Horde pipe? The Horde pipe. Oh, Horde. I missed the D in there. Oh. Uh, Whoops. I mean, I think they're interchangeable, right? Mm. At least. Everything's I, interchangeable these days. I'd recommend the low sec route. It's going to be a lot more coming for that. Yeah, probably. And... You'll get more of the randoms. Yep. And they're less protected. But, uh, I mean, if you don't want to be in tie-dye, you don't like shooting structures, I'm sure there's like a, a region where there's a lot of people, a lot of assets in space. You could probably go get some easy kills. You are a master of segue, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah, speaking of which, so uh, I, uh, I invited... Right, Rick and uh, Vic Jefferson on because they've both been in, actively involved in something uh, known as uh, bee control and goo whaling, respectively. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know, uh, while the goons have been deployed to uh, the north and various areas of uh, New Eden, they've left their poor little no bears out and about to uh, suck up uh, minerals and ore by themselves with no protection which has been a perfect opportunity for these guys to uh, go and swat some bees. So we thought we'd bring them on and talk about what it is they're doing and why it is they're doing it. Well, Vic, you want to go ahead and start it out? Uh, you're, yeah, I, well, go ahead first, man. I mean, I've been there for a while. This is bee control is kind of your thing, so go for it. Yeah, that's what I was saying, because Vic's been there for a while, and a few other folks uh, from PL and whatnot have been harassing uh, goons for, for a long time. But Bee Control was really a pet project of mine um, when our first procurers were attacked in Declan while we were uh, deployed in, in drone lands back in October, if I remember correctly. And basically, uh, goons took advantage of our situation from October to November, to the end of November, um, and attempted to just harass all the slice procurers. But uh, we know, like, Really, the number one rule in EVE is if you touch a slice procure, it will cause you pain in the long run. So um, what we've done is kind of asked everybody from, from EVE and said, hey, if you want to go and, and help out, um, we've learned a few tricks from goons. They start bombing uh, slice excavator drones, and it works really, really well. You don't have to have a, a big fleet to uh, knock out excavators, and they cost a billion a pop. Uh, so we only have a couple hundred oracles, and but goons have thousands. So their risk to it and exposure to it is significantly higher. So I poked Vic and others and uh, those folks that have been hitting Delve day in and day out, and I said, guys, let's, let's gather together real quick and see if we can really hurt them um, where there's no SRP and where we can hit these bullies um, using the same tactics where they're hitting others with. And so we started forming bomber groups, small gangs, and different solo hunters to go to Delve and go after Oracles, and specifically their excavators, if they had too many supers covering them. And it's worked out. Uh, if you guys have looked at the excavator losses, um, December is when we started it. It was the worst month for excavators. 
for the entire year of 2017. And excavators are super expensive, right? They're like a billion each. Yeah, in fact, I wanted to link you that uh, stats for them. If you look here in 2017, and, and just look at Z Killboard, look at excavator losses, uh, you'll see that December was the worst month it's ever um, hit excavator ships since they started registering kill mounts. And uh, these things are really the source of goons power. Uh, they keep bragging about their monthly economic reports and it's mainly due to their oracles being totally safe, having mm -hmm. uh, the super cap umbrella just covering their butts. But those super caps can't protect the excavators. And we collected bounties uh, from donors and even high sec freighter pilots that's been ganked by code and and Minilove and, and Goons, we sent them a video and a donation page and they started donating ISK towards the fund. And so we give bounties, we give a hundred million for every excavator paid or every excavator killed and every Oracle that you kill, you get 400 million ISK. So it, it piles up. I don't know, I think Vic's gotten billions and billions of ISK just coming from, <laughs> <laughs> he could probably buy a super now from, uh, all of his ask, but uh, the donations are continue to come in, uh, especially when there's a high sec for, uh, freighter pilot that gets ganked or you know miners getting ganked. And we continue to run the program. We're fully funded for uh, January as well. So really excited to see the results. And we're seeing you know battles where it's 200, 300 billions a pop, especially when uh, goons try to go and move their supers uh, to fountain or cloud ring. So I just want to say, like, Riot Rick is doing a great job, and B Control really is, you know, a great thing about EVE is, you know, there's just, you know, some people get an idea and implement it, and all of a sudden everybody can participate. It doesn't really matter if, if you're just a couple people with, like, some T3s popping up drones in, in uh, Delve, or you're, you know, a guy with a, lot, a bigger group and you can run bombers. Whatever you can run, you can earn bounties from it. So whatever your group size is, it's an activity, and you can make money doing it, you can have fun doing it, and, like, all of Eve, besides goons, or perhaps goons themselves, can just take part, and it's 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 fun to do that. It's part of the it gives you a sense of the gravity and the scale of Eve. It's fun, and you're making a little bit of an impact because if you actually look at the monthly economic report, we've seen this awesome trend that goons have been having month over month over month, where um, nobody was just stopping their mining; they were just unstoppable. And then December clunk it was a 15, 17 percent downward trend. And that's a good thing, right? I mean, that's what we want. We want uh, all those uh, bees to stop running the hive, right? Well, I mean, the thing is, I understand CCP is in kind of an impossible place because the work is so hard to balance. What is balanced for a smaller group living in Null and what is balanced for something as large as the Imperium are two different things. And it's impossible to pigeonhole that ship into the right scale. The scale they use them in, in that region, they're so hard to kill. So you basically have to go for the exca excavators. And, and it's good that you can. I mean, it's good that you can present some threat to them in that way. Because in that region, as opposed to others, they're very hard to take down as a ship. Yeah, absolutely. When they have the super umbrella there, it's very, very difficult. Um, but when we do see that they're going after very big targets, like the Skeep Star, um, or in December, they were going after a uh, Horde Osterhops in Cloud Ring. They sent all their supers there and left Delve unprotected. And in one day, in that one particular system, we cost about 200 billion worth of damage uh, just because their supers left uh, the area. Well, that was aggressive. So if you're a small group, what, what, what ships are you, are you seeing the most traction from? Um, You know... The, the smaller groups, typically like T3s or um, MJD destroyers or lots yep. of small frigates, and they'll just go in there. They'll develop their own techniques. There's a couple of good ones going around. Um, I'm sure people in B-Control will be more than happy to get you going. Uh, bigger groups typically run bombers, as far as I know, but there are, again, there's lots of strategies. Yeah. The yeah, Olmeca, um, who was a previous bombers bar FC, 
you know, he he multi boxes a lot, and he's been able to get a system going where he combat probes them and just booshes them off, uh, and then kills them or scoops them. Uh. He uses two or three clients. That's it. So he booshes them and then um, kills them with a bomber or a T three D. These must be really ballsy guys for not calling in their drones on a neutral zone system. Well, the thing is, goons have gotten so complacent because mm-hmm. they, for a long time, they've been completely unfettered there. People are just are scared to go in there because if you move, you're going to get dropped on by all holy hell or bozen to death or something. It, it used to, it's a very rough region. Now it's not so bad, but it might go back to being just like a place where the second anything that's not blue moves, it's crushed. Definitely had several roams and very super heavy. Yeah, they just count in your heart. So there's B control is set up in a way where you're not blue to anybody, right? You're, nobody's forcing you to do anything. So there's uh, really the, your investment in time is just dependent on how much fun you have. And you can go there and try to avoid all these titans and supers and still cause damage against the biggest bully in the game. Is this just uh, goon characters, or is this uh, Imperium allies as well? Yeah, so B-Control covers Delve, um, Curious, so anybody that's in uh, the Imperium. Great, and obviously the highest concentration is in those core Delve systems, but you know, I know there's a lot of goons in South of Fountain. Uh, I know there's a lot of goons in uh, fake Aquarius. Fake Aquarius. Or fake Delve. I guess it's fake Delve, which is Aquarius. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, it's it's been fun, and there's a lot of folks uh, working uh, with B-Control, and part of it, they were all disconnected groups, right? So, you know, um, NC, PL, and uh, GOTG, when we would roam in Delve, we would have just have no coordination whatsoever. Uh, B control kind of brings that together, and recently you've seen uh, hundred man bomber fleets because everybody's working together through that avenue. Are there open uh, open Astro houses or retarus available for uh, people to camp out? So D- Delve has N- NPC space, so that's where most of uh, fo- where most of the folks can stage in, but. It's not very hard to put an alt inside goons if you ever need isotopes or a new bomber. Fair enough. Karma fleet's always recruiting. Yeah. So, so if you're if you're uh, wanting to get involved in this, do you have to be in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy or NC Dot or someone, to, or can you just be like, hey, I want to join, you know, do some NPSI type shit? No, not at all. Um, we've got Bombers Bar in there, so you know we got FCs from Bombers Bar that um, help out significantly, and they've gotten a few oracles as well. Um, if you're a solo hunter, uh, poke me, uh, right, Rick, and then I'll look at your kill board. I'll look at what you've done in the past. And if I believe that you're a capable hunter, we'll add you into our uh, network and get you paid out. So I'm going to ask the question. Everybody's dying to know because we all love discords. Is there a bee control discord? There is absolutely no bee control discord. Oh my goodness. Come on, I gotta get 31 discords at least. I need it. Gotta feed the, the beast. Alright, Vic, did you want to go into a bit into the whaling as well? Um, if I can drop bombers on it, I will drop bombers on it. <laughs> <laughs> we will not stop dropping bombers. We didn't, I mean, just the fact that the goons are out of the house is great, but even before they're out of the house, we'll drop bombers on it. I mean, if you like that playstyle, I know it's not for everybody. If you like blobs, it is the place to be. Um, you've got so many targets, and we've got—I mean, a lot of people know their stuff, and they're hard to—they're hard to get and, and tell. But they're just that sheer concentration of so much of the null population in one region guarantees you've got the best game reserve. There are hazards yeah. to it. It's not like the drone regions where, like, you know, you tackle something, you're probably going to kill it, but. If you can keep up with it and manage your risks, it's a great place to be, and I encourage everybody to just kill goons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So these bees sting, but I mean, they're it's a very, very good game reserve. 
as far as uh, as far as the response that you get, Vic, maybe you can uh, confirm something that I've been hearing recently. Did goons gate camp you with titans that were smart bombing when you had a um, bomber fleet on? They never. They have done some things like that. Yeah. Um, so despite what you say, what yeah, I mean they've done that. They've dropped a lot of smart bombing titans. They've camped all of NPC Dell with like 200 goons a system for an entire week. They've done all kinds yeah. of stuff to try and stop me. <laughs> and and by me, I mean Castle Poita. That's everybody is contributing to it. It's a huge effort. Uh, but it really hasn't stopped us. It just encourages us more. Um, and that's kind of the thing. It's like you. There are ways around everything they do. And if you learn those ways, you're pretty much safe. Yeah, and, and that's what covert ops is all about too. It's being covert. Like you know, they've they've had sixty supers one time go um, station camp four bombers, but the rest of the bombers were outside, and they could just bridge in and out. And goons basic. The thing is, they have so few people in in goons right now that are actually know their stuff that it's easy. It's good pickings, right? And you have to call. And Eve, it's great to call bluffs. They they can't really defend all the renters, vassals, and serfs that they've recruited. I mean, if you look at how big they've gotten in the past year, that that's basically all they are. And and again, it's no fault for being a renter or whatever. If that's your thing. But they and there's no way to get that many people to be null competent that quickly and quite frankly imperium doesn't care they just want to win uh, the you know the economic war well they want to have your taxes they want to they, right. they charge five percent against i think any corporation that joins them and that that feeds them that feeds the machine i mean the ideal situation would be if if you're looking to rent that you don't rent from the imperium Instead, you run from somebody else because you, if you're if you're in Delve, it's going to be camped. There's going to be bad guys in every system, and you're going to have to deal with that ever-present threat. And the only real attraction of joining there is the fact that you've got this wonderful blanket called Super to sleep under. But if they can't defend you and they don't do their part, well, there's no attraction, is there? Yep, you're done. And don't touch slice procures. Don't do it. They're dangerous. They're dangerous. That's like the number one rule when you start out as saying, don't tackle the slice procure. All right, so give us how to get in touch with you guys. I've got my nice, juicy excavator kill. I want to share it for some uh, sweet, sweet bounty. So bcontrol.fun is the website. Then we can review um, your application from there. There's a ton of application on there. So I apologize if there's delays. If you really feel like you're the best solo hunter ever, just go poke uh, Vic or me, a Riot Rick, uh, in game. And if I lose my bomber, I poke Grath Telkin. Yes. Wait, really? With your favorite <laughs> flavor of ice cream. It's an, it's an old meme, but it checks out. All right, great. Well, uh, bcontrol.fun. Get that dank, dank bounty rewards. Yeah, so so uh, follow up to that, you know, essentially, you know, we were looking at last year about this time where we were, we were ending uh, the casino wars, and we had just uh, were working on uh, the the B the, the goon extermination with the uh, money badger coalition. Is this kind of like a stem off of that? Are we still trying in that mode where it's everybody against the um, the Imperium? For some I, of us, World War B never ended. Just right. putting it out there. I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we can keep fighting this as long as it needs to be fought. And and here's the thing. Well, with World War B, I mean, there's lots of circumstances surrounding it. And there's really no way to beat the goons militarily with their size. So you can't do that. I mean, the citadel mechanics are huge. You can never fight them in an open war. With, you know, it's going to be very difficult. They have material advantage. They have all these things. But the thing you can do is make it, is attack them, as Ryder Rick says, at the source of the power, which ironically is Rurkles. And so... You have to put the pressure on where they're actually getting powerful from, and that's industry, and that's ratters and miners. If you attack them in the field, they're always going to be able to win a war of attrition. I mean, there's no way to do that. You might dunk a fleet, and I don't care. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, unlike Vic, I, I really don't actually have a hate boner for goons. I, I just don't want them to touch my procures. <laughs> yeah, I think it's... It's it's we're in a weird time. Like goons has finally kind of come out of delve. They're they're starting to poke things, which is good for the game. And it just seems like we're factionally we're factionalizing up a little bit. You know, you've got the DRF and you have test helping the DRF. 
You also see Test helping Horde on the other side of it, fighting against goons. And you've seen, we've had goons come and shoot us and help us at the same length in uh, in our drama over here with dealing with the DRF. So uh, it seems a little more fluid. It's a little more of a uh, uh, back and forth, it seems. It's not, it doesn't seem it's just 100% like if you're on grid, you're shooting goons kind of deal like it was with the Money Badger Coalition. Right on. Yeah, I mean, it, I can agree with that. I think Tess being friends with goons is a great example of that. They're not blue, but they're blue troll. But at the same time, I mean, this, again, for me, it's like, look how much they, they can outproduce the rest of the game. I mean, you can't really ignore the elephant in the room forever. And it's great if everyone's fighting everyone. That's the ideal state. I, I, I mean that. But look how big they're getting. That you got to police that. <laughs> Yeah, but, I mean, but, and it's nice that you know groups like you are all doing it. But again, it it's going to take someone to actually you know throw down the gauntlet and say, "Hey, follow me in." And I don't think anyone in Eve right now is willing to drop that gauntlet. Right I don't now. think you can. Though. I think the mechanics yeah. prohibit it. Like you again. I mean, you're never going to get them out of that many citadels. You're never going to fight them in an open war sustainably. You know. I mean, I don't understand. The only way to actually beat them, I think, and you can call me a fool for saying so, I don't care, um, is to separate them from their renters and their serfs and their vassals. You have to make it abundantly clear that they cannot just arbitrarily scale forever and ever. Yeah, and that, that's true for any you know big um, organization, but Goons is the biggest whale out there, and um, they've used their power, uh, and they've tried to go and leverage their power uh, even before World War B, against everybody else, whether it's Pravi or um, folks in the South when they used to live in Declan, uh, and lo- against LOSAC entities. So we they've had uh, a history of being the biggest and um, really the, the worst bullies in the game. And it's very, very easy for people to simply attack them just because of that. I, mean, I don't like goons for personal reasons, but you, they are... They are what they are. They're the apex, one of the apex groups in EVE. Either you go in and do something about it, or you sit there and hope you're not the next one they step on. That's the thing people need to see, I think, is, is, is pretty much those two. I mean, they are great at big fights because they have big numbers and they have big resources. But when you think about it, a lot of the other alliances out there have people that are much closer to, to the mechanics, have much better knowledge, or much better on grid, and they have to defend themselves, their space for themselves. They don't have a super blanket to do it for them. They're much better pilots on average, and if you just expose that and use that, you can get to where the goon, you know, you can get at the goon. Yeah, I think we've proven a lot of those case studies, right? Um, inside the month of December and in January, we've been able to prove that uh, even with the super cap umbrella, you can cost just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of damage um, to that industry, to that machine. And we're coming up about 600 billion in December. We're coming up to about a trillion in January with, with overall damage with excavators, oracles, supers, um, all in. So you can cause a lot of, of pain uh, against these bullies, um, but you have to know your mechanics. You have to know how to fly um, really a bomber, a boosher, uh, or the ability to go and hunt and avoid uh, you know, Titan or super dread bombs. Sweet. Well, it sounds like an exciting, good place for uh, an avid solo or small gang group to go uh, cut some teeth and get some paid to do it. Absolutely. All right, well, do you have anything else we want to cover before we wrap this show up? On that front, on the B-Control whaling front? Uh, Nope, just shout out to the team. Uh, It's really being run by the FCs out there. I'm just a guy that pays. Mm -hmm. All right, Kale, you want to walk us through uh, the Eve meets around us? This uh... I I would absolutely love to talk about some of those Eve meets. So we're looking at uh, Des Moines... Des Moines, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, on the 26th of January. So that's this coming weekend in Urbandale, Iowa. Uh, then your the next day, the 27th of January at 6 p.m. Oh fuck! I just got potted. Jesus Christ! See what happens. When, thank you very much. <laughs> um, 
That's what happens when you're roaming around Delve and making fun of Chinese people. Um, 27th of January in uh, D.C. slash Arlington, Virginia. You're looking at the D.C. Eve meetup. The Cincinnati, uh, Ohio Eve meetup will be on the 27th as well at 6.30 at the Hofbrau House uh, in Newport. Uh, Hofbrau House is a, a wonderful, or Hofbrau is a good beer. I actually got a gallon, as I'm kind of going off topic here, but uh, they had a gallon in October for the Oktoberfest beer that is actually imported from uh, Munich, from Hofbrau. Delightful. I drank that whole thing in one night. Um, then you've got Eve Breck. So that's in Breckenridge uh, on the 1st of February. And yeah, that's it for the upcoming meets. Yeah, shout out to my Vancouver meetup. Uh, Freaking CCP Snowden brought his uh, 3D models that he's been showing off on Twitter. They're actually like hollow 3D printed, fairly large, like the size of a beer mm. can Vexor. That uh, was just beautiful. It was beautiful. That, that reminds me, I'm actually slowly but surely working on a Nix printout. It's going to be about be about a foot long, but here's one-fourth of the piece. It's actually going to be broken down into four pieces. Here's one, two, and three. So that's how long it's going to be. This is just, just uh, one side of it, so that's going to be the Nix. So I'm 3D printing that right now. Sweet. All right, let's go through some uh, some shoutouts, and then uh, let's take this uh, herd of cows back to the barn. Uh, let's start at the bottom. Vic? I'd just like to shout out to everybody involved with Castle Poitant. You guys have been the best pilots ever for the longest time, and thanks for sticking with it from the very beginning. Best name, too. Uh, Riot? Shout out to Slice, GOTG, and Hordlings. We're going to have a lot of fun tomorrow. Yep. Mm-hmm. Sven. Uh, shout out to the Brothers in Great Wildlands Coalition, and then shout out to Try for inviting us to come kill Vexers. Can never have too many Vexer kills. Uh, Cyclo. I got uh, two shout outs today. Shout out to the Imperium. Because you guys just took a, lo- a bit of a beating on this show. Uh, hopefully we can find somebody to, from your group to get on next time we have something relevant to you guys. Uh, and then I also have a shout out to uh, the Mind Clash podcast. Uh, for those of you watching the Mind Clash podcast who uh, are not watching it live, we do broadcast live on Mondays. And I'll toss a uh, link for all this stuff in the uh, Discord, which reminds me, if you're not on the Mind Clash Discord, make sure you uh, hop in that Discord. It'll be in Twitch chat. And uh, make sure you follow the Mind Clash Live Twitter for a live updates and see when we're going live. And uh, make sure that you go ahead and hit subscribe on that YouTube channel so you can catch up with any of the podcasts that you might have missed. Thank you very much. Uh, and he never hypes his own show and his oh, own right. Twitch yeah, stream. Hype your, hype your shit, man. I, th- I think that's... that's... No, I'm too modest for that. He runs a good stream, even when it's killing my own fucking friends. <laughs> Twitch.tv backslash cyclo underscore hexmel, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. And I also have a YouTube channel that I try and put uh, new bro friendly content for PvP out on. You will learn things. That's true. Sure I've heard that. I was using that killboard freaking searching technique this week. Oh, so yeah. nice. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a nice little tool to use. I learned that in my first year as an AT captain. It's, it's just it's really strong, Super great strong. for gathering intel and things like that. Oh yeah, I just want to pull like some vagabond fits off. Oh, search vagabond fits. Choose an alliance. Pick an alliance. Bam, bam, vagabonds from this alliance. All right, pull the fit off there with the copy fit. Link to my Jita tune. Buy all. Bam, into the courier contract for deployment. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, oh, Ryan. Uh, shout out to all my guys in Lethal. Try guys, good fight today. Thanks for all the guys who showed up to help us out. Uh, good fight. And shout outs to the DRF dudes and uh, Test, you showed up. Hope to see you all again. There's always more testies. Kale? 
I'm just gonna gloss over that one. Uh, yeah, only shout out I have is uh, this Friday is gonna be my youngest daughter's birthday. She's gonna turn three, so happy birthday, Astrid. Uh, it's gonna be fun. We're gonna have a, a 80s themed birthday party. We're gonna have like tie dye stuff, and we're gonna play Twister and all kinds of cool ass 80s shit. And I can bust out all my cool rad clothes and maybe ride around on a skateboard while I'm rocking my trapper keeper and my slap bracelet. You know what I'm saying? Get totally tubular with it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. To totally, bruh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Anyways. Uh, for my part, uh, shout out to my alliance for always fucking hosting good roams while I'm fucking going live. Bastards. And to, uh, <laughs> to the guys who we're fighting with on our deployment, I uh, hope to have some more good cap brawls with you guys. Just don't call those stupid wormholers. Scary. Fucking wormholers. Remember, there's no such thing as wormholes. I know. I don't even know where they come from. Imaginary space. All right. Thank you all for watching live. Uh, thank you all for watching or listening in post. And we'll catch you next week. Uh, we should be, I don't know what we're covering. We've had a request to do some more Alliance spotlights. So if you have an Alliance that you'd like to be uh, spotlighted on Mind Clash, maybe bring your CEO, maybe bring your recruiter, maybe bring your diplomat and some line members, and we can uh, put together a show for you. Uh, similar to our NC dot show that we had last week. Uh, we'll cover probably, let's say, have at least like 100 guys. Uh, doesn't matter what section of space you're in. We'd love to talk about you. A hundred? I mean, why can't it be fifty? I mean, small corpse, you know, need no. to have some love too. No. Whatever. Get more alts. <laughs> Rook Pelt has a lot of alts. There you go. I can 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 confirm. Rook Pelt is mostly alts. We're all Ben Bully alts in the end. I'm sorry. Check, check, check. All right. Well. Good night, everyone, and uh, we'll catch you next Monday for another uh, episode of the Mind Clash podcast. Thanks for the invite. See you, boys. Thank you.